You're very lucky. Especially you. Let's wait for them to finish their presentation. Right. I'm going to break tonight into two parts. First, I'm going to reprise the Cold War talk I've been giving over the past six months or so. Um, I've presented Cold War at JSConf US in Florida, Web Directions Code in Melbourne, Australia, and TXJS in Austin, Texas. After the talk, I'm going to introduce you to the Cold War platform. So Cold War is an environment for writing your own simulations. Um, it comes with a bunch of built-in simulations, and I'm going to walk you through some of those as a way to show you how the platform works. And hopefully, if we have enough time and everybody is not too faded, we'll have a look at a little bit of code, and maybe we can bootstrap you into writing some of your own service. So when it comes down to it, Cold War is about a construct called the game loop. The game loop. This animation is called Minimum Viable Warfare. At the bottom, we have a base. It can fire a single shot in its defense. For raining down from the sky and the silence. Their sole intent is to destroy the base. This is the foundation of some kind of game or simulation. It has the basics, but it's kind of boring. So let's tweak the parameters. Here, the sky can fire two missiles at a time to try and destroy the base. This swings the odds heavily in the sky's favor. It's going to win quickly, every time. So let's tweak again. <laughs> this is more like it. Here, the bases can fire as many shots as they want to try and defend themselves from the missiles raining down from the sky. An impregnable defense. <laughs> Until you run out of bullets. <laughs> then it's just a matter of time. So let's tweak again. <laughs> Full blade. Everybody can fire as many things as they want to try and defeat their enemy. It's amazing. It looks like fireworks. But the astute JavaScript that will observe the browser is starting. Jank. What's a jank? It's nearly 2016 and everybody in this room should know what a jank is by now. <laughs> Let's see some diagnostics. There are two things going on. We have an update phase and a paint phase. In the update phase, we do all the math required to work out where our things should be on the screen. In the paint phase, we draw them to the screen. To achieve smooth animation, we need to do this 60 times a second. This gives us a time budget of approximately 16 milliseconds to do all of our work. If we exceed our time budget, the diagnostics go red, and the browser starts to jank. But not all hope is lost. We're getting nearly 2,000 things on the screen, 60 times a second, before the browser even starts to break a sweat. This kind of performance is OK. In more detail, this is what we're doing. Forever and ever, we go update, paint, update, paint, update, paint. This is called the game loop. The game loop. But do not do it like this, because you will burn out your CPU. <laughs> so instead, we use window, window dot request animation frame. Here, we ask the browser to call us when it's ready to draw a frame on the screen. We update, we paint, and we launch another callback request with the browser. The process repeats. In an ideal world, the browser will call us 60 times a second, and we will get smooth animation. We have a set of variables we use to represent the universe we have created. We update these variables according to some rules. We use the values of these variables to tell us where to draw stuff on the screen. We clear our painting surface, we draw stuff to it. Easy. Job done. But real life is never easy. There is no guarantee the browser will call us 60 times a second. It has other things to do, and we are not that important. So we have to work out the time difference between now and the last time the browser called us and use that to create a scaling factor for all of our physics. If we do this right, and not all the edge cases are covered here, we will get smooth animation. When it's time to draw, we use HTML5 Canvas, the great unloved Canvas tag. Canvas is amazing. It's supported everywhere except for IE8 <laughs> and IE7 and IE6 and IE5.5, and I do not think IE4 had Canvas either. We have an HTML tag. It's a canvas tag. We get a reference to that tag from the DOM. We get a drawing context from that reference. We call methods on that context to make stuff appear in our canvas, in our browser, on your screen. Easy. But to truly understand HTML5 canvas, we must understand how a computer display works. 
Back when Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States, computer displays were made out of a glass tube. When entered that glass tube, it was large and rectangular. On the interior surface of that large rectangle was painted a coating of phosphor. At the rear end of the tube, there was an electron gun. It would fire a stream of electrons down the tube towards the phosphor-coated surface. When the electrons strike the phosphor, they would cause it to glow temporarily. Wrapped around the stream of electrons was a set of magnets. These magnets can cause a beam to be deflected horizontally and or vertically to any location on the front of the glass tube. Now, if you have a region of memory and you sequentially read the values of the bits in that memory and use the values of those bits to modulate the electron beam on and off as you scan it across and down the front of the glass tube, you can cause a representation of the values held in those bits to be painted to the front of your screen. This is how a bitmap display works. We call this a raster scan display. A raster scan display. Raster scan displays are the foundation of all computer displays in use today. But there is another way to do it. Back in the dawn of computing history, computers were far less powerful. You would implement your display in hardware. You would send a list of drawing instructions to your display circuitry. These instructions would cause the electron beam to be deflected around the front of the screen, much like you would draw lines on a piece of paper with a pencil. This technique is called vector display. Vector display. Vector displays have one amazing property. Simply by multiplying the intensity of the magnets that deflect the beam as they scan it around the front of the glass tube, you can cause the image to be scaled up and down with incredible ease, just by modifying the value of one or two bytes of memory. To do the same thing on a raster scan display requires a lot of complex math. You have to calculate the position of every pixel you want to draw, way out of the league of a computer from the dawn of computing history. Tragically, the technique of vector display has been lost to the sands of time. <laughs> but HTML5 Canvas gives us the best of both worlds. We can rotate the scale and translate our images with incredible ease, throw bitmaps around the screen with wild abandon. And if you look closely, you can see vestigial move to line two commands that are the direct descendants of the original instructions used to scan an electron beam around the front of a glass tube. Just how much wild abandon I hear you ask. Here we try and draw as many shapes on the screen as we can. We fill up the screen with shapes. Before it is drawn, each shape is translated and rotated. We're getting 2700 odd shapes on the screen in 5.6 milliseconds. 60 times a second. If you're trying to do 60 frame a second animation, you still have around 10 milliseconds left every frame to do all of your math. JavaScript can do a lot of math. 10 milliseconds. Your first step to truly mastering HTML5 Canvas is understanding these transform commands. Canvas operates on a grid. The origin of the grid, 0, 0, is at the top left of your canvas. If you draw a shape around 0, 0, it will appear in the top left of your canvas. These transform commands let us modify the grid before we draw stuff to it. For example, the translate command. It lets us move the origin of the grid relative to the current origin. So if we transform to half the width and half the height of our canvas on an untransformed canvas, our origin will now be in the center of the canvas. If we draw a shape around 0, 0, it will appear in the center of the canvas. We did not have to do any complex math to do this. Rotate and scale operate in the same way. We can put an image at any size, at any position, at any rotation on our canvas without having to do any complex math. Get your head around this, and you're well on your way to make full use of canvas. So what have we got? The game with update paint. Request animation frame, 60 times a second. An HTML5 canvas, a reasonably performant way of drawing stuff on the screen. Let's make a simulation. This is a pretty famous simulation called flocking. Flocking. Each of these things flying around the screens is an independent actor. It minds its own business. It observes the world around itself and decides what to do based on what it observes. The little white things follow a few simple rules. They want to fly in the same general direction as their immediate neighbours. They do not want to crash into their neighbours. If they get too close, they will turn away. And they do not want to get eaten. If a big red predator gets too close, they will turn tail and run. The big red predators are far simpler. They turn towards the average of the position of all of the little white things. So from a handful of simple rules, we get some behaviour that's spookily organic. It looks like fish in the ocean avoiding sharks. What we did not do is program the behaviour we wanted to see. 
we made a set of rules, and the behaviour we got came from the interactions between those rules. We may or may not be able to predict the behaviour we get. We call this emergent behaviour. Emergent behaviour. We're going to use emergent behaviour to try and simulate nuclear Armageddon. Let's see if we can predict the outcome of this simulation. Any predictions? Yeah, everybody dies. <laughs> Tragedy. All right, what the heck did we just see? Well, if you want to have a war, you have to have a nation state. The heart of a nation is its capital. If you lose your capital, it's game over. A capital commands and controls. And in our case, it acts as an air defence system. We have a set of successive defensive perimeters. As they are breached, we escalate our response towards the enemy. But the soul of a nation is its people. People are born, they go to work, they pay taxes, they die. They provide the labour for our military industrial machine. People work in factories. In factories, they produce munitions, the weapons of war. Munitions are stockpiled at bases. People go to work in factories. The munitions they produce get stockpiled at bases. When it's time to deploy said munitions against the enemy, the capital tells the base to attack. The base determines the method of attack. We have bombers. We have fighters. We have anti-ballistic missiles. We have intercontinental ballistic missiles. The weapons of war. Now, if you have a hegemonic nation state sitting just over the border looking scary, stockpiling munitions, you will probably want to destroy it. You will send your bombers. Bombers are big and slow and powerful. They fly long distances and drop their apocalyptic payload upon the enemy. If you see a swarm of supersonic bombers coming over the horizon towards your factories and cities, you will scramble your fighters. Fighters are fast and small and agile, but not very powerful. In sufficient numbers, they can swarm and overcome incoming enemy bombers. Pretty soon, though, you will get sick of this air war business. You will have your scientists develop you some intercontinental ballistic missiles as an offshoot of your space program. These bad boys fly to the edge of space and rain down apocalyptic oblivion upon the enemy. If the enemy starts launching missiles your way, you will scramble your anti-ballistic missiles. Cheap and only moderately effective, these puppies fly up and explode near incoming enemy ICBMs. If effective, they take out the warhead and rain down radioactive debris upon your jungles and shipping lanes. Being a first world nation, we have a, a decent space program. You will have your scientists develop you some killer satellites. At a cost of mere billions to the taxpayer, these sit in low Earth orbit and take out nearby enemy ICBMs with their high-powered lasers. If they're close enough. So that's the rules. Let's have a look at it in effect. So you guys over there, you're cheering for that side. You guys over there, you're cheering for that side. <laughs> Two nation states square off, stockpiling munitions until one balmy Tuesday morning, one of them will launch a sneak attack. It's these evil bastards over here. <laughs> Blue bombers fly towards Yellow's homelands. Yellow scramble their fighters in defence. Will they be successful, or will Blue punch through the middle and start destroying things? Yellow launches a counter-attack. <laughs> blue is undeterred. First strike to Blue. Off go the missiles. <laughs> Who will it be? Definitely they need some cheerleaders. <laughs> oh. You want to watch another one? Yes, yes, yes. Let's play it through again. Let's hear some noise. Come on. <laughs> Who will be launching a sneak attack today? <coughs> oh. Sneaky. <laughs> That's a decent spot when they go there too. I hope you're ready. Oh. This might not end well. <laughs> we think some emergent behavior here. When I programmed this, I had no idea how the bombers would fly. You can see some always punch through the middle, some go around the edges because the bombers try and avoid each other. So that means the ones that go around the edges come around the back of the defensive. Oh, it's all about that.
So we've seen how it works. Let's have a quick look at what goes on in the inside. We have a set of variables we use to represent the universe we have created. In our case, we will not be so greedy. We will just create a world. A world has a surface area, an X and a Y, and an airspace, a Z. We create a world with these proportions. The world captures these options and makes them available to anyone who has reference to the world. If you can see the world, you can see how big it is. We initialize our world. When the world initializes, it creates containers for all the actors in our simulations. We have capitals, bases, bombers, explosions, many more things. But the heart of our simulation is the nation state. The heart of a nation state is its capital. We create our capitals, and each capital spawns all the assets it needs to make the nation state. We make a capital. We push it onto the world's list of capitals. Now, if you can see the world, you can see all the capitals in that world. We give the capital reference to the world. We give it a team color. We give it a position on the map. The capital creates all the assets it wants. So if we look at, say, bases, it has a limit of how many bases it can have. We count up to this number. We add these bases. We push them onto the world's collection of actors. The base has a reference to the world. It knows who its capital is. And we use some kind of algorithm to work out a strategic location relative to its capital. Once we've made all the assets in our simulation, we start the game with them. We update, we paint, repeat, 60 times a second. Everything from here on is 60 times a second. We update. We pass now scaling factor for our physics. We iterate through all our actors. Each actor gets a chance to update. For example, a base. It asks its capital. Are we at war? Should I be launching an attack against the enemy? If I've got some bombers in stock, I'm going to make a new bomber. I give it a reference to the world, its capital, I pick a target for it, and I give it a location on the map. The bomber starts at the same location as the base. Finally, I deplete my list of bombers, my stock of bombers, so I do not launch an infinite number of them. The update code for the aircraft is awesome. Making a bomber. We make a bomber. It captures these references. It knows who its target is. It knows it's alive. We manage its position with this vector object. We store the position in a separate object. We go through all our bombers, they update. If they've been destroyed, we splice them off the list of bombers. They get garbage collected. The update code for the aircraft is probably the most complex part of the sim, but it goes something like this. I have a look at my target. If somebody else has destroyed my target, I pick a new one. I fly towards my target. If I'm close enough, I'm going to destroy it. If there's a friendly aircraft nearby, I make sure I don't crash into it. If there's an enemy, I avoid them, but if they're close enough, I want to destroy them. We manage the position of every actor in our simulation using this vector class or object. It holds an X, Y, and a Z, but it also has a number of methods attached to it. Many of these methods take another vector as an argument. This lets us perform operations on two different vectors. For example, a bomber flying towards a target. I have my position, I have the target's position. I subtract my position from the target. I normalize it to unit length, I multiply it by my velocity, and add it to my position. It's just a really simple algorithm for flying towards a target. Shooting is the same. If the target's in range, I want to be able to attack it. Really, it's just a three-dimensional version of Pythagoras' theorem. But instead of expressing this in code, we use methods on these vectors. This lets us come back to our code three, six, or 12 months later and see the intent of our code, rather than actually having to decode our mechanics. To, to make it happen. So really, it's, if it's close enough, shoot. It makes it much simpler to, to manage the simulation. When it's time to draw, HTML5 canvas. We have a canvas tag. We get a reference to it from the DOM. We have it on our page. We use some JavaScript or CSS to scale it to fit our browser window. We work out how big it is. And we, we calculate a scaling factor between the size of the canvas and the size of our world. We're going to use that. Every time, I paint our, every time we paint a frame, we clear our painting surface, we save the transform state, and we scale our canvas by the scaling factor. This means when we draw on the canvas, we can use world coordinates instead of canvas coordinates. Basically, we don't have to do any math. We can literally use the values in the position object to draw our actors on the screen. We iterate through all the actors. We give each actor a chance to paint itself, and we pass it a drawing context to use. Finally, we restore the canvas back to how it was. So for example, again, painting a bomber. We save the transform state of the canvas. 
We translate to its position using world coordinates. We rotate to face the way we're flying. And we draw a shape, put the canvas back how it was, and the next actor gets a clean canvas to draw with. So when we finally get to draw the bomber, we're drawing around zero, zero. It's already been rotated. It's in the right place. We can just draw our objects using really simple terms. And this little Z scaling factor is for the design phase of our project. We can just change one number and make our item bigger or smaller. This is roughly how Cold War works. The fundamental concept. Update the paint. It's really simple. Before we look at the platform, we've got one more simulation to look at. If anybody does not like this one, they can blame Thomas because he said it was all right. <laughs> Come on, I want to hear some cheering. <laughs> Best of three, okay? <laughs> I don't think this is realistic. <laughs> oh, that's pretty realistic. <laughs> Maybe my uh, cartography skills are not quite. <laughs> why, is, um, why is the country kind of having a bit of a problem with its water? It seems to be a little nervous. <laughs> I'm a reclamation. <laughs> reclamation. It's not rigged or anything. Are they, are they like randomly generated or? I oh, know all the objects they're placed, yeah. but the, the spawning here yeah, is a degree of random there. <laughs> is it based on like the really comic figures? <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful which country I present this in because I get in a bit of trouble. Okay, I'll change this. Okay, okay. So if you got a laptop, pull pull this up. We're going to have a look at the platform now. So we're just going to. This is a bit less formal. If you've got questions, throw your hand up. We'll see what we can do. So let's have a look. Uh, Right, so this is Cold War. This is a, a platform built in these concepts. When I wrote the talk, it was really... It's a slide deck, effectively, written in the browser. But what I've done is extracted all the simulation stuff from it and, and tried to package it up a little bit. Um, what we're looking at here is a bunch of different scenes. This is an index page for all the simulations this thing ships with. I've got a few more than you'll see on the website because uh, they're my crappy ones I'm trying to develop now. But I'm going to show you those later because hopefully it's an interesting direction. We'll start with Cold War, because you've already seen that already. The first thing you notice is we have controls. So I can hit the tab key to hide and show these controls. Uh, I can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out, and I can drag around. So you can get into some fairly good detail there. I can go zero to put the size back, or plus and minus to scale it in and out. Um, if I go enter, it restarts the simulation. And if you hit the backslash key, you see some diagnostics. So we've got how many milliseconds to update and paint, how many frames per second, actually the mouse position and the zoom size, and some counters here. So we've got one that goes from, it's adding the delta up to 60. So roughly we see which frame we're on using this counter. We see what our delta is, we're getting 60 frames a second, so that should be hovering around one. And this one is either broken or goes from zero to one. I can't work it out quite yet. There's a bug there, I think. But if we have a look at these controls, <coughs> The top one is for the scene itself. So the scene is really, you think of it like maybe the controller or something for the whole simulation. Uh, and then each of the actors um, really has parameters. So every capital uses these parameters. So I can do stuff like, uh, I can turn up the number of capitals. We've got a few more capitals there. Um, if I turn on first strike, I think they go to war pretty much straight away. But I'm, we're going to have a look at this, because this is the most fun thing to do with it. 
first we turn up the satellites as much as we can. Uh, and we put their DEF CON starting at 1. So they're going to go to war straight away. And then we give them lots of ICBMs and lots of ABMs. <coughs> and we let them launch a whole bunch of ICBMs at the same time. And then you end up with something like this. That's much more fun. <laughs> and so we're, we're holding up. Well, we're at, 40, we're at 40 frames. So this is kind of hitting the limits of what the thing can do. But there's a whole bunch of different scenarios you can come up with here. Now, if we have a look at this, I'll just take it out of full screen for a second. It actually puts all the parameters in the URL, so you can copy and paste that and tweet it or mail it around or whatever. And if I, if I paste that in a new tab, it'll basically go back to where I was. That's how you share the simulations. So that's Cold War. You can go and play with this one. Um, if I hit Escape, uh, it'll go back to the top. So m most of it's keyboard driven. Deep Space is the next one. I presented this at JSConf Asia 2014. Um, I think the way to explain Deep Space is to go back to first principles. You start with a planet. We're trying to simulate a planetary economy with four numbers. You have population, agriculture, industry, and pollution. And um, this is in need of a bit of love, I think. But basically, the population works in the industry they make spaceships. Spaceships take some of the population and fly off into outer space. So these little dots here, you see a spaceship shooting off, and you see the population drop back down, and the productivity drops, but then they grow back up again. So we have planets that spawn spaceships. Awesome. But what you do then is put them into a star system. Right? We can have planets orbiting around a star. The spaceships take off. They go and colonize other worlds. Now, this number under the planet is the population. Uh, you see they fly to another planet, decimate the locals, and take over the planet, and start making their own spaceships. So, yeah, the natural thing to do is uh, always turn up the number of planets. There you go. Now, gravity's an effect here, right? So the spaceships actually have trouble flying around because there's too much gravity messing with their flight paths. You turn up the species. So you can have a whole bunch of species competing for conquest of a star system. Awesome. How many frames are we getting? That's holding up, that's right, it's not even blinking. And yeah, we can zoom in and see it in nauseating detail. I'm very proud of the, like, the dark side of the planets. It's kind of... <laughs> All right, so you can do that, that's pretty cool. But then you take a whole bunch of them and put them into a universe. Now we've got star systems bouncing around the finite space, they actually bounce off each other. Um, these guys take over their local star system and then try and colonise distant stars. Wow, Green's made a go of this one. So we'll turn this up a bit. Let's turn up the numbers and see how far we can go. And you find it ends up a bit congested, right? So they can't actually bounce around properly. So we can make the thing a bit smaller. Let's just let this play out for a bit. Has anyone, anyone got any questions at this point? Yeah. No question, just a round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you. No questions? The obvious question is why? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is obviously, this is a hobby, not paid work, probably? Or? Completely, yeah. Look, for me, I, I wanted to make this deep space thing when I was like 16, right? I was trying to program this. As, as, you know, in nature, I wanted to scratch. Um, it, it also, the whole thing's vanilla JS. There's no libraries. And for me, that was, it was really good fun doing that. And it a real eye opener. But like, I actually learned a heck of a lot doing that. Um, so th th this will play all day. This will probably take an hour to finish. So we'll skip out of this one. What else have we got? We've got interception, you've seen this, and you know, the usual thing to do is just to turn the numbers up and, you know, it's like cheap tricks. So we won't dwell on this one. If you're going to write it, there, there are a few different ways you can approach writing, writing a sim. I think interception is a really good starting point if you want to use actors, right? Because it starts with, or it's got three or four of them. Copy this and, and just modify it until it does what you want. This, this one is blindingly simple. So that'd be a great starting point for writing your own. The other one to look at is, is life. 
Now, there's, there's actually a fundamental... Can any, does anyone spot the fundamental flaw in, in how Cold War works? What's the fundamental problem in the way I'm doing the update? Come on, think fast. Think fast. Yeah. Huh? Right. So, when you do life, everybody knows the game of life? Who, who does not know the game of life? Okay. So, when you do life, each of these cells is working out what happens next based on the, the neighbours around it. So you have two arrays. I have a cell, and I work out what happens to it based on its neighbours, and I write the result into the second array. And the next tick, I flip them around and use the, the destination array as the source. In Cold War, I don't do that. I have one array with the actors in it. So I update the first actor, and then I update the second actor. Now he has to look at the world around himself and go, what should I do based on the state of the world? It's looking at the first actor that's already updated, right? It doesn't matter. It still works fine. It looks, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? It looks good. It's good enough. It does the job. Life will not work if you do it that way. So this is... That's one key point. The second key point is, is life is a different way of writing a simulation. We don't have any actors. We just have a simple data structure, and we update that every tick. So the, the next step on from life is rabbits. Just... It's a different thing, but it uses the same principle. You have rabbits and foxes. Right? The little blue ones are rabbits. They run around eating stuff and reproducing like rabbits do. Foxes eat rabbits. So if a rabbit meets a rabbit, they reproduce. If a fox meets a rabbit, it eats it. If a fox goes too long without eating rabbit, it dies of starvation, which lets the rabbits grow back and then the foxes can come back. This is actually a pretty accurate model of, of real predator-prey relationships. You can do another version with, with grass as well. Foxes, rabbits, and grass. This is really the, the, the foundation of the planetary economy, right? Life, rabbits, planets, space war. <laughs> it's a natural progression. Um, right. Um, attract. Now, there, there are a couple that use this next one. Well, attract, right? So this is the demo mode for Cold War. You saw this in the talk. This is kind of a reboot of that. If you watch this for a second, it skips through to another kind of scene. The way we do this is, I've got an array of, kind of an array of, uh, an array that describes what should be drawn on the screen. Right? So each, each element in the array is an object, and it has a bunch of stuff telling the simulation what to draw. And you have a counter. So you count up to, say, 100, and when it hits 100, you bump the index of your array to the next value. When you get to the end of the array, you go back to the first element. So this is a, almost a third way to write. Not really a simulation, but it's a way of doing scene-based uh, animations. So, we have a look at this. Is it, see how this text is wobbling? How do you reckon you do that? Anyone got an idea of how to do that? It's a really, really cheap trick. He's got it. Math.random is your best friend, right? Because all I'm doing is translate math.random or math.random minus 0 0.5, so it wobbles around, right? It's so cheap and easy, but it looks awesome. <laughs> so much of the animation here is just really simple math.random tricks. Um, so this, this uh, I call it modulus animation. You have an array with an index. You advance the index according to some time counter. You draw something new. Uh, this one's basically built the same way. And again, it's just... It has, <clears throat> it has an array describing what the bitmap looks like, and I just advance the counter along it, draw some stuff. This is really easy to do. And I added in the memory source, so it's memory through to the display. Every time I present this, somebody bitches at me, blah, blah, Joshua, blah, blah, Joshua. Right? So I finally got around to... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, there's two things. Every time I present it, it's like... It, Two tweets or two comments. One is, why didn't you do Dear Professor Falk? And, you know, no, you know, have you heard of this? Yeah. The other one is, you've got to stop flashing the screen because somebody's going to have an epileptic fit. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, I'm waiting. <laughs> when somebody has an epileptic fit, I'll stop flashing the screen. <laughs> Volunteer? No. Anybody? Um, yeah. This should probably be a library if someone wants to volunteer. Um, this would be a great thing to extract as a cheap and nasty little library, and hopefully we see it on lots of websites soon. <laughs> yeah, but in the meantime, you can paste your own content in there. Uh, what do we got? So predators, you've seen that. This is probably one you should play with yourself. This is kind of interesting in that um, 
you know, these different forces that apply to the birds, do they stick together, do they fly apart? Um, how, how do they keep away from the predators? So th this is kind of fun to play with, but we won't dwell on it. Um, how much this? work has gone into putting all this, like, I mean, how long have you been, have you, have you been building this? Oh, months. It's a lot of work, yeah. Um, a lot of it was extracted from the talks, but it's also been re... I, so I kind of, the talks came first and then... Yeah. And, and the, with, the, with the talks, the approach I took was um, make it work. doesn't matter. The code, I don't care, right? I'm just going to make it work, and if it looks good, it is, which is a valid principle. But what I've done is try to work out how to structure it as a way... A pattern more than anything. I won't call it a framework. I don't want to call it a framework. It's a pattern. So, and, and it provides some structure for you to build stuff within. You've got a scene, you've got some actors. We'll have a look at that in a sec. Um, this is just playing with the explosions. We've got a bunch of different explosions, and yeah, you can play with some parameters. This would be a really good one to start with if you want to um, start figuring out how to do it. A random rainbow. I'll turn on rainbow mode, and they will get the same color. Nice and simple. Uh, where are we at? Yeah, this one's kind of boring, but this is actually a talk I want to do because frequency is an, is an interesting thing. Because it's not just circles and sine waves, but if you look at things like, well, we have color here. If you look at capacitance and filters, there's so many things come out of basic frequency concepts. So one day this will evolve into something more detailed. But at the moment, it's just a party trend. Um, um, do you want to elaborate on why you? Um, chose to write it in vanilla JS as opposed to using a framework. Um, I'm not. I'm, there's no. Um, no, it's, it's yeah. because I wanted to know. I wanted to um, even things like this page is the only page that's in HTML in it. Um, <laughs> and and right, how do I do that stuff? Yeah, how do you, how do you take away the crutches? Because it's not hard. None of it's hard, but it's it's so easy to use the crutch, right? And then. <laughs> Even things like event handlers and the mouse handling and stuff. And to be honest, it, it, it's, it's improved my JavaScript no end, right? And, and you go, oh, dude, it's so obvious. Why do I need a library that wraps like two lines of code? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Come on. And, and I'm finding that more and more. It's, it's, especially with, with Node, even. Like, 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 I'm really. There's some things you want to use as a library. Don't write your own crypto. Mm -hmm. But so, much, so many of the libraries you find around actually not, don't do very much. You open them up, and I was going to say that about async with Joshua's talk. It's like, you know, if async's slow, why don't you just have a look at the code and rip it out and do your own version? Because it's only, it is only a few lines of code to do that stuff. Um, right, so we're going to branch out for a sec now. We're nearly done with this bit. But I wanted to show you some of the things I want to do in the future. So we'll start with this. This is, and this is incredible, right? This, this is NASA simulating. Uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide in the atmosphere over a number of years. And you can see the, the Amazon breathing, right? This is a daily cycle. I mean, this is unreal. Supercomputer processing here. You can see the jet streams moving across, you know, one going this way, one going that way. And you can see the forest fires, I think, in Indonesia here at some point. It's, 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 this, this is incredible. Look, look, look at how much crap we're putting into the atmosphere, right? So I've got a friend who he was really ripping me. He's, he, uh, I, I rehearsed the talk with him over Skype, and he's saying, "Man, Simon, why are you always doing warfare? You know, what can you do that's not warfare?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, get out of here. Um, but it did get me thinking, and I think this is an ideal simulation that doesn't use warfare. But I got an angle on it, so we'll look into that. Just as depressing, though. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, we can't control it. Um, but th th this atmospheric stuff kind of cool. I mean, basically, it's, it's, it's fluid physics. So we dig around, and there's a wind map. We'll see how the network is here. I mean, th this is beautiful, right? This is real-time wind data in, in the States. Th this, yeah, I just think this is beautiful. But then, how do you do it? So we found this library here that's, oh, no, I don't want the, I don't want that, I want the demo. So we just have a look at a simple one. I think it's, um, just find it natural convection. And you love the start button, right? Go. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. But again, this is this is actually getting to the realms of the doable, right? There's some vectors, 
and there's some kind of density going on. Yeah, th this is reasonably doable. Yeah, and they got the source code for it. Awesome. So, what am I going to try and do? Well, let's have a look at this. Is, this, is a, this is a plane for a bit of coding here, right? I'm going to try and simulate a world. So we have we have a grid. That's the world. Each of these squares, some of them are ocean, some of them are land, some of them are mountains. We've got a day-night cycle rolling across the Earth. These little dots are meant to represent the atmosphere. It's so primitive, so don't, you don't laugh at it, okay? We've got the jet stream moving the atmosphere left and right. But this, the goal of this simulation is your job is to manage the economy. You get to choose the power mix you're going to use. You can use renewables, you can use coal, you can use oil, you can use nuclear. Right? Now these pink circles are nuclear power plants. Eventually they're going to pop. <laughs> and nuclear waste will percolate through the atmosphere or the oceans or whatever, right? But your goal is to successfully create the maximum output from your economy while managing the power balance. Okay, so this is meltdown, this one. Um, and then I tried to dig a bit further into that. Well, yeah, I've got to start somewhere. How do we simulate a basic convection currents? And I'm an amateur at this, but basically you just have a cell and the heat migrates upward and a bit goes to the side and a tiny bit goes down and some of it grows across the top. So what you find with this is that uh, it uses a lot of CPU power. So if I start doing this, our frames per second goes way down, right? It's not even going to do it. So I'll just back it off a bit. I think I've broken it. I put uh, the diagnostics actually put numbers over everything. But if I pump a whole lot of heat in the air, you'll see it rise up. And when it gets too cold, we get random heat injection. So yeah, this is just playing around, right? So one day this will turn into a real simulation. But this is kind of where I'm going with it. And there's one more. So that, that's the that's the atmospherics. I'm kind of a, a real retro game fan. So if we have a look this game called Major Havoc. They're two retro games that, that really mean something to me. This is a real vector game, right? I think this is off MAME, so it's not quite, it's a bit pixelated. Um, but this is a real vector game I used to play when I was a teenager. And it actually has a really beautiful story. See this eons ago, the evil Vaxian Empire over in the galaxy. <laughs> right, everyone gets the reference? This, this game is a work of art. The guys who did this poured their souls into it. <laughs> but, <laughs> We have a look at the gameplay a little bit. So this has a spinner on it, right? It's like a mouse that works in, in one dimension. You can go left and right, but the speed is proportional. You can walk or you can run. The idea is to run through the maze, tap the reactor, and then get out of the maze before the reactor blows up. This guy's a hopeless player. <laughs> but it's got lots of crazy stuff in it. So see that it's got Pong down here? He's already blown it, but on Pong there's a number underneath the Pong, and if you spin it to the right numbers while you're playing Pong, you can warp ahead in the game. So this, this, this game is just full of Easter eggs and hacks and tricks. It's really cool. So the other one is, if I can find the burrows, bear with me one second here. Uh, I don't think this is right. Hang on. I've lost my plot. There we go. The rats of the maze. When I, when I was like 13 or 14, I'd go into my dad's work and they had this computer there. Now, this is the big daddy one. This is in the computer room, right? The machine room. My dad's one just had one of these little vertical slabs on it. It was a 386 based networking computer, the Burroughs something, Burroughs 2000. It was amazing. But it, it had a game on it called Rats. This is the only screenshot I can find of Rats of the Maze. So it's kind of like Berserk. You run around this maze, there are these rat generators that spawn little rats. You have to run through the maze and shoot the rats, shoot the rat generators and go to the next level, I guess. But I played this game for hours. So what I want to do is mash up rats of the maze and Major Havoc. You have a maze, you have rat generators that spawn rats, you have to get to the reactor, turn it off and get out of the maze. This is, again, this is a, a, a plane flight hacked together. This has heaps of really interesting stuff in it. You've got maze generation algorithms. That, that's, that's an interesting problem in itself. You've got the seeking behavior of the rats. How the rats 
negotiate a maze and maybe maintain some separation to home in on the character. How does the character run through the maze, get to the reactor, turn it off while avoiding the rats, and then get out of the maze again? So you've got, you've got mazes, you've got AI, you've got animation. I mean, when you look at this, he'll be properly animated kind of at this size, running through the maze, right? So this is kind of where we're, I'd like to get to with the simulations after I stop being sick of it for spending months and months and months coding it up for this. So, any, any questions at this point? Everybody's still with me? Yeah. We'll have a look at a little bit of code, okay? I won't keep you too long. So, um, it's all online, it's MIT, copy it, fork it, do whatever you want with it, contribute back. Um, I use JS Hint, but there's like 300 or 400 issues with it at the moment, so if you want to jump in, <laughs> that'd be really awesome. I started doing it, and I was like, no. <laughs> and you've got to use semicolons, else so you're out of it. <laughs> so most of this you can ignore. It's got a hacky-based web server. It's running Node. Um, it spins up the server. It serves some assets. Most of it you can ignore. Server, what you care about is server, public, JS. Now the first thing that loads up is this app runner. That takes care of the, the URL parameter passing you saw. Uh, it, it, it starts up the scene you want to run and it takes care of all that housekeeping kind of stuff. It basically it calls update paint once everything's running. Your simulation itself is a scene. So all these scenes follow pretty much the same kind of pattern. You know, they have this boilerplate at the top. They, they clone from an object. They initialize. They present these defaults. So these defaults are what get turned into the configuration menus you see down the side. Oh, sorry, sorry. So I'll start again. You, you, you've got this boilerplate function here. You clone an object. Um, you initialize. This one's really basic. You might have, so if this is Cold War, initialize is where you set up all your assets and everything. But Booms is just setting up a container. These defaults are what get turned into the menu down the side so you can configure the the simulation. But really, what you care about is, is uh, update and paint. Just want to look at adders. There, there are none in this one, but we have two constructs in here. There's options, which are the defaults you saw. They, they are the settings that are effectively static. You've got adders, which are the dynamic parameters. So if you've got a timer or some health or hit points or whatever, that's going to be an adders. They can change over time. And often what you do is use you, your parameters here to, to uh, generate kind of ranges for random values in your parameters. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we can update paint. Right, so I go through each explosion, do some stuff to it, whatever I do, and then I paint it. Each of them gets a chance to paint themselves. And then the painting method, you get passed in some pre-scaled canvases, Canva. Right, we, we have three of them here. And they actually, a couple of tricks here. So GX is the main one, right? That's just a, a fully transparent canvas you can draw to. FX is what I call a fadeback layer. So you paint something to that, but every frame I paint over a, a, like a 3% black, and that has the effect of a, over a, about a second or so of fades of canvas black. So if you draw something to that, um, you can actually see it here, probably if I... So you can see these horizontal lines that are blinking across. They are on that fade layer. I'm only drawing that line for one frame. Now, normally you wouldn't actually really see that, but because it's on a fade layer, it stays there a bit longer and kind of lingers around. Um, these stars, I'm not sure if they're doing that. But most of the explosions are drawn on, on the fade layer then. And then SX is the, uh, it's the scanner, that's the one up the top. So when you set up your scene, you can say, I want to have the, the one full scene, or I want the split screen with a scanner and a zoomable layer down the bottom. So we have a look at that, and then look at an actor. Actors follow almost the same kind of setup. So we have a look at our, can we see? So a bomb is the thing from interception, that flying down from the top of the screen. Really, it's the same. You set it up, you capture some references, you initialize, you manage our position here. We have some defaults we expose to the, to the framework, to the platform. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. See here we generate some real actors. How fast am I? Yeah, random number. Um, you can ignore all of this. You can do it if you're really interested. Update. 
and paint. Paint is down here somewhere, paint. And the elevation is, uh, there's a scanner up the top, there's the elevation view. You really have a, it comes from a cold, top down view, rats, and an elevation view. All right, any, any, any questions? Yeah. Have you tried seeding, for example, the cold war with like real life data? Like, I mean, like the place in Singapore, you know, get the stats of the media. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I haven't, but this um, would be a good one to try. Can you do like asymmetric warfare next? I want to see like ISIS versus France or something. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I got the name already, it's called Predator. <laughs> okay. um, I have a concept drones, based yeah. on that, it's about drones. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> hiding and running, basically. <laughs> cool. Yeah. You, you can, I mean, Actually, most of the bits to do this stuff is already there. The, the, the other one I wanted to do was um, trench warfare, the, um, because that, that, that really lends it's a horrible concept, but it lends itself to simulation. You got, you got probably half a dozen different actors, and it's all pretty nasty. But yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any plans to add any AI to this thing? Any? Uh, artificial intelligence to this? Um, absolutely. Rat, rats is probably the first step to that. Thing, um, because it involves the pathfinding through the maze. But yeah, yeah. And I mean, contributions welcome. I mean, for me, this is a hobby and a toy. I really hope some people can get into doing some of these and send me some pull requests, and I'll I'll add your scene to the front page. Right? Uh, I want some quality simulations here. What I'm writing are just toys. Right? I, um, yeah, I do this in evenings and weekends, and to do this properly requires a lot of work. Yeah, that's why it's the vector graphics. I, I, actually, I love the vector graphics, right? I don't want to have a bit mapped. It's like Mario characters running around doing it. Vector graphics are more fun. Um, but there's a whole whole world of exploration that can be done here. Yeah? So what's your day job? Uh, I write a, a cloud system for Internet of Things. So we, we do... Um, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> IoT, yeah. It's very interesting. Any more questions? Yeah, Josh. Is it considered uh, using battery to speed up some of the simulations, like convection? The, the, actually, for, for convection, that'd be the right thing to do, wouldn't it? Offload that processing. One thing I did try doing is web workers for, for some of it. I wanted to see if I could spread some of the work around, but what I found is they don't share memory. Right? And, and if you don't have shared memory, you're wasting nearly all of your time passing messages around, which makes it kind of useless for this. Because you, you need a shared memory pool and then work on segments of it. But yeah, for convection, that would be completely the right way to do it, I think. Right, if there's no more questions, we'll probably call it a wrap. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, I guess that's, that's the end of uh, TalkJS uh, DevFest Asia edition. Um, thanks for coming and eating all the pizza. I couldn't have done that on my own.